Okay, why don't we get started? We have a pretty full agenda and, um, and uh, people will join. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm Roy Herbst, uh, Chief of Medical Oncology. And of all the jobs I do here, I think my greatest honor is to uh, organize the uh, Calabrese lecture each year. And you'll hear why the Paul Calabrese was a mentor and friend to me. And um, it's great to have his family together. I just wish we could have all been together here in person, um, but it's great to be here uh, you know, virtually um, and to have uh, a discussion you know, at the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And as you'll see, Yale had so much to do with it. Uh, Paul, Vince, and we're gonna hear from the NCI director. As we start, I'm gonna turn it over to our current uh, interim director, Nina Huja, to make a few welcoming remarks. Uh, Nina. Thank you, Roy, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. And um, I wanna thank the Calabrese family for joining us today. And um, also that we look forward to having you back here in person, hopefully soon in New Haven in, and share this uh, day with you. I wanna especially thank Dr. Sharpless for taking time out of his busy schedule to present this year's annual lectureship and share his insights on the National Cancer Institute priorities and reflections as we also celebrate 50 years of the National Cancer Act. And Roy, thank you always for all your thoughtful leadership of the Calab annual Calabrese lectureship, which gives us an opportunity to pause and remember the impact of one of the great leaders and influencers in cancer research and care. And with that, Roy, please, um, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Hey, thanks, Nina. Renee, if you could put up that first slide, I, I, I'm gonna introduce Vince DeVita now, and I guess we'll start, I just wanna show one slide that I think um, says it all. So, you know, um, you know, so there you see Vince, that, that picture is probably right outside of uh, Ned's office. I think he probably passed it on his way today. And uh, Vince can tell us if he wants uh, uh, what, what, what that represents. And then we, of course, you see Vince with a former president. And I always ask you, Vince, what, what did he tell you that made you laugh? But we'll take the slide down. And I'd like Vince to give us just a couple of minutes perspective, given that he was there when it happened. Yeah, well, actually, it was, I said something to him that made him laugh. It was not easy to make laugh. <clears throat> and people always ask me, what was it you said? I haven't the foggiest notion what I said, but whatever it was, it seemed to be funny. <clears throat> Roy asked me to say two things about the early days of the NCI. I had sort of had an advanced look at the Cancer Act because I was taking care of the, the guy who wrote it uh, at the time. And so I, he gave me insights into what was going on. I, like most people at NIH, I didn't care for the idea but I grew to like it as, uh, as time went on and I became director of the Institute. I like to remind people that the mandate of the Cancer Act was to support research, the application of the results of research to reduce the incidence, morbidity and mortality from cancer. So that was on our mind as we started to spend the money and we did pretty well in the first decade. 85% of the money went into uh, basic research. And, we had two problems I think Ned would like to have now. Uh, there were problems for us. We couldn't spend all the money. It's very hard when you weren't staffed up to spend a hundred million dollars. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that the NIH doesn't have what we call no year money. You get money allocated in a given year, you have to spend it or you have to give it back. Giving it back was politically untenable. So we had to figure out how to spend it. We resorted to contracts because we could do that faster, which is a very controversial. Uh, decision. The other, the other problem we had was the grant pay lines. They were consistently around 50%. So we were funding 50% of approved applications. And there were people who said, my goodness, that's higher than we've ever seen. It turns out, of course, 50% is essentially approving 100% of all grants that had a fundable pay line. Most grants are, are not rejected. They're just given a score that you wouldn't fund. So when you fund all 50% of approved application, then every grant up to a score of 250 so it was funded in those days. So that was, those are the halcyon days for submitting a, a, a grant. Uh, we also did the same thing in the applications. Uh, we, the clinical trials program went from $9 million to $110 million in six years. And the cancer centers went from three to 15. Uh, so that, that was the application side. The application side was controversial. Uh, the NIH never saw itself as applying research and the Cancer Act changed all that. How have we done? Well, you know, we decreased, incidents began to decrease in 1990, and morbidity has been fat, vastly uh, diminished uh, in both surgery, radiation therapy, and systemic therapies, and mortality has been coming down steadily since 1991. So it, the mandate 
uh, I think has been followed over a time period that was perhaps longer than most people anticipated. I think it's fitting to celebrate the 50th anniversary at the Calabrese lecture though, because Paul was very heavily invested in the, in the war on cancer. And he served as advisors to two presidents. He was appointed uh, the uh, chairman of the National Cancer Advisory Board by one president and, and, the pre and a member of the president's cancer panel by another. Both presidents were different uh, and they were from different parties emphasizing Paul's uh, diplomatic skills. When I came to Yale, he uh, readily, he was very invested in Yale and, and the Yale Cancer Center and he, be, and he agreed to become the chair of our scientific advisory board. And then he was chair of the overall advisory board. And then because he suggested it, he decided it would be good if he was chair of both at the same time, because he could have an annual dinner with both boards and, and show each other what we were, were doing. It was typical of Paul to do that. He was, he was, he was gregarious. Uh, and it was just a wonderful thing to work for him. I first met him in 1965 uh, when I was actually working with his father, Massimo, over at the VA. Massimo was the head of cardiology. So I, I go back a long way with the Cal Calabrese family. Paul was a Renaissance man and it was a real pleasure to know him. I miss him uh, often. And so uh, I'm happy to do this and, and I'm happy to welcome you, Ned. Uh, to uh, give the Calabrese lecture. I must just say one thing about your, the title of your talk. Uh, it's an intriguing title, uh, Modifying Cancer as We Know It, suggests that you have another dimension in mind for evaluating outcomes in cancer. I, I look forward to seeing you unfold this uh, in your lecture. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. And, and for our fellows from 1 to 1.30, Vince and Ned and the fellows and the fellowship leaders, we're going to have a little just informal lunch, you know, virtually, just to sort of have the fellows have a chance to get some mentorship from the leaders uh, in the in the field from the NCI. Okay, let's let's get on to the uh, the, the talk. I'm sure um, Ned is ready to go. So welcome, as I said, you know, I'm really uh, uh, so happy to inv invite the family online today, the Calabrese family, and I'm especially uh, honored that you're here with us today, Ned. Uh, you're this year's Calabrese lecturer. Paul Calabrese is often referred to. And if we could go to the first slide, Renee, as the father, please, as the father of oncology and his influence here at Yale Cancer Center remains. A former faculty member at Yale School of Medicine, he was an internationally recognized authority on the pharmacology of anti-cancer agents. Dr. Calabrese served as the director of Yale Cancer Center's advisory board, as you just heard, until 2003. On a personal note, I had the good fortune to meet Paul, it says 30, but it's actually almost 40 years ago, as his son, Peter, was, I guess these are the same notes we used 10 years ago when I started doing this, was my freshman roommate here at Yale. Over the years, Paul was an advisor, mentor, and friend to me. And it's very meaningful to me that I now hold the job that he once held. And it's not, it doesn't go unnoticed to me that in room 208, I constantly, during a difficult meeting or a challenging question, uh, have his face right in front of me. Joining us today are the Honorable Guido Calabresi. Guido is in Italy. Uh, Guido will ask the first uh, question, as has been our, our tradition, so get ready, Guido. Um, and of course, Paul's brother and uh, a judge, Janice Maggs, his daughter, and Peter Calabresi and Stephen Calabresi, his sons. Thank you all for joining us and for helping to continue your brother and father's legacy here at Yale. And Peter, um, I don't want to take too much time, but I know we sent a globe to every member of the family and some of the speakers, you should have it. Do you just want to say one quick word before we move on? Sure. Again, I don't want to delay the lecture, but on behalf of our whole family, thank you so much, Roy, and everyone at Yale, and, and thank you, Dr. Sharpless, for giving this lecture. We're very much looking forward to it. Okay, and now to introduce Ned, and if we can go to the next slide, we're honored to have Dr. Sharpless here today, uh, the director of the National Cancer Institute, to honor 50 years of the National Cancer Act for him to share his insights from the NCI. Prior to his appointment at the NCI, Dr. Sharpless served as the director of the Leinberger Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Sharpless was a Moorhead scholar at UNC Chapel Hill and received his undergraduate degree in mathematics. He went on to pursue his medical degree from UNC School of Medicine and then completed his internal medicine residency at MGH, Massachusetts General and Hematology Oncology Fellowship at the Dana-Farber Partners Cancer Care. Dr. Sharpless is a member of the Association of American Physicians and the American Society for Clinical Investigation and is a fellow of the Academy of the American Association of Cancer Research. He has authored more than 160 original scientific papers 
reviews and book chapters. And as an inventor on 10 patents, he has co-founded two clinical stage biotechnology companies, G1 Therapeutics and Sapphire Bio. Ned, it's really an honor. And I haven't sent this yet, but I have. And if you go to the next slide, please, Renee. I have this lovely plaque that can go right next to Vince's picture there at the NCI. Beautiful plaque um, and uh, for your office, uh, commemorating that you are our Calabrese lecturer. We're so honored to have you. And now uh, the floor is yours. We look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you for that kind introduction. It's good to see old friends, at least virtually. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. I, I love New Haven, and, uh, and we, we will have to take a rain check on this. Um, I'm really excited today to, to do this because um, for two reasons. One is it's an opportunity to talk about the National Cancer Act and how important that's been on its 50th anniversary. But also, I, I think you know it's a, an opportunity to recognize a real giant among cancer researchers and cancer care caregivers and such an important leader in our field. Uh, next slide. As has been said, uh, the Calabrese family has a deep connection to Yale, including uh, the, the Paul's father, who was a cardiologist, I'm told, and uh, his mom had a degree from Yale. And we've heard about uh, Judge Calabrese and his imminent work and, and work with Yale. And we hear about the next generation of Calabrese's having these deep Yale connections. Uh, Paul Calabrese also had a deep connection to the National Cancer Institute. He was, uh, I think his career actually uh, began doing field work for the NCI uh, and then served the NCI in several capacities, including as uh, chairman of some of our most important advisory boards, National Cancer Advisory Board and the President's Cancer Panel, as Vince alluded. Uh, and uh, if uh, the Honorable Guido Calabrese, uh, who I'm told is here today, let me offer a heart heartfelt recognition to all the Calabrese family for what they've contributed to Yale and, and, and improving what I, I believe is the human condition through their work. I'm really also pleased that uh, Dr. David is here. Uh, Vince is a giant in our field. Uh, and has a direct connection to the, uh, what we're talking about today, the National Cancer Act. Uh, Vince joined the NCI in 1963 and was NCI director from 80 to 88. And uh, Dr. Vita has been a, a wealth of good advice to me in this role. I found his book titled The Death of Cancer, a really interesting thing to read before I started as NCI director. I recall having a very interesting conversation uh, with Vince about the FDA prior to uh, me going to the FDA to be acting commissioner for seven months. And it was uh, really uh, informative to have uh, that perspective in the back of my head as I worked uh, regulating uh, food and drugs. Um, so I think it's a, a fitting memory uh, th that we're going to talk about the National Cancer Act today, in, 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 given Dr. Calabrese's connections to it. His contributions to cancer research, cancer care, and the infrastructure, so to speak, of our research capabilities uh, made him a real giant in our field. And I'm really talking about his work in uh, you know, understanding the pharmacology of cancer chemotherapy, his uh, work in a combining chemotherapy with other, other modalities, his leading edge research in geriatric medicine, I think it's very prescient for a cancer researcher, uh, his devotion to patient care, which has really empowered his research activities, his leadership on countless boards, committees, institutes, academies, societies, and various other governing bodies. But I think perhaps most importantly, his invaluable <coughs> mentorship to a ge real generation of leaders in cancer research and cancer care, including among them, one of my old bosses, Dr. Bruce Jabner at the MGH. At the NCI, we honor uh, Dr. Calabrese's contributions with a specific grant in his honor. It's the Paul Calabrese Career Development Award for Clinical Oncology. And these are K-12 grants that are really designed to prepare oncologists for, for effective scientific careers, and in, in particular by pairing them with basic scientists. And I was uh, actually the PI of uh, the University of North Carolina's K Calabrese Award uh, many years ago, and I know how important an award that is. And I really think it's fitting to honor Dr. Calabrese with a training award uh, for that, 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 that stage of someone's career, given his terrific legacy of mentorship and of training. So today I would like to talk about uh, the National Cancer Act and you know, how uh, that changed from the period of uh, Dr. Calabrese's career to uh, modern day. And I, I think the efforts of, of Paul, along with other luminaries of the past five decades, really drove and made possible the tremendous progress we're seeing today in cancer care and cancer outcomes. Uh, their work uh, really provided uh, th this progress in the past, but also made possible these opportunities that I believe lie before us and that really will shape the future of, of cancer research and cancer care. Next slide. I think it's hard to overstate the importance of the National Cancer Act in 1971. For those of you who are younger who don't know a lot about the NCA, it did not create the NCI. So the National Cancer Institute dates back to the 1930s. Uh, but I would argue in many ways the National Cancer Act created kind of the modern NCI, the thing that we recognize today as the National Cancer Institute. It really united patients, doctors, scientists, industry, and government in a, in a common vision. And from my perspective, I think the NCA really did three important kinds of things. So first off, we heard from Vince about how it provided additional funding for cancer research. And I'm sure that that 
uh, extra funding was very important to Dr. Uh, Carl Baker, who was director of the NCI at the time. And uh, I, I think, you know, uh, more support for cancer research is always important. But I would actually argue that the funding was probably the least important of the many important things the NCI, NCA did. It also, the, uh, a second type of activity the National Cancer Act did was it gave the NCI a bunch of new, three, new authorities and created new critical infrastructure that really led to sort of some of the modern capabilities of the National Cancer Institute. So it, it encouraged the NCI to create a national database of cancer statistics, which led to the SEER program, which is the, arguably the most important set of cancer statistics in the world. It really created Frederick National Lab, which is a way of doing research the NCI uses. It, you know, it really invigorated and provided the framework for the modern cancer center program that we've heard about. It made the NCI director presidential appointee. It did a bunch of other things like the President's Cancer Panel and the National Cancer Advisory Board, things that were really important. And I think those authorities and new infrastructure were a really important part of the NCA. But maybe the second most important thing it did. And the third thing that I believe the National Cancer Act did, and arguably the most important thing the National Cancer Act, Act did, was it made cancer something that we could talk about as a society. It, was, it, it, it turned cancer from a disease that had stigma associated with it and, and, a, and, a, and, 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 a, and a diagnosis that was sort of hid in the shadows and it brought it out into the light and uh, really spurred uh, the modern interest we have in cancer, the ability to talk about cancer, the ability to work on cancer and the modern cancer advocacy movement, which has been so important. Uh, so it was really important to act and it did uh, things of terrific significance. But as visionary as the National Cancer Act was, it was also naive. Uh, many of uh, the individuals involved at that time thought we'd have a cure for cancer very quickly, you know, five to 10 years. I think this was motivated by the experience of, you know, antibiotics and sepsis in the early 20th century. And obviously, you know, that things didn't work out that way. Cancer turned out to be a much more difficult problem uh, than we understood in 1971. But uh, we now uh, have worked for five decades uh, to, uh, to better uh, develop that basic science understanding of cancer. And, and, and today we are really having much better understanding of the molecular underpinnings of cancer. And that uh, better understanding is paying huge dividends for patients now. Uh, next slide. So there are lots of ways to look at the remarkable progress uh, in cancer over the last few decades. Um, and some of the various takes on that are shown here. But I believe that we'll, we'll look back on this period right now today uh, as a golden age of cancer research, where we really began to take the basic science understanding of cancer and apply it to human benefit in a very direct way. And as I said, we'll, we'll think about this era today the way we think about you know, antibiotics in the early 20th century for infectious disease. And, uh, and it doesn't always feel that way, I know. I realize that the burden of cancer in American society is still uh, very significant. But uh, from my perspective, where I sit, the progress uh, in cancer is really remarkable. Here are a few lines of evidence. So first, uh, on the far left here, we see uh, this decline in cancer mortality. This started in the early 1990s, where cancer mortality peaked in the United States and has declined for both men and women since then for lots of reasons. Better cancer screening, tobacco control, uh, lots of uh, things have conspired together to lower cancer mortality rates in the United States. Uh, but in recent years, this has really picked up. Uh, markedly, and, and I think in, in recent years, some of those massive declines in cancer mortality are related to better therapy. So, in, for example, I've shown statistics here for lung cancer, where a bunch of new therapies, uh, kinase inhibitors, immune checkpoint inhibitors, radiation, better radiation surgery, et cetera, have all led to a remarkable decline in cancer mortality on the order of 6% uh, from uh, 2013 to 2016 per year. So fairly sharp decline in the most lethal cancer of humans. This has been uh, matched by a remarkable increase in FDA approvals of drugs and devices and other medicines for cancer patients with a remarkable uh, period of productivity. I can remember when I started out as a fellow in this business, uh, you could go a whole decade and not really have uh, amazing new drugs approved in cancer care. And now it's, it's a monthly event at the FDA. Uh, there was a period in 2020 in one month where I think we had seven lung cancer drugs approved in the same month. So really and, and not uh, B2, uh, not useful drugs, but really uh, paradigm changing new therapies. Uh, and, and I think there's real scientific excitement in, in cancer research. And that's shown down at the bottom right here. And that's the graph of uh, applications to the National Cancer Institute for funding. Uh, we can see uh, this massive increase since 2013, a, a nearly 50% increase over about a seven year period in applications for funding the NCI. And this is a mark that uh, you know, people have great new ideas for cancer therapy and are coming to our field with new proposals and new, new uh, ways of treating cancer that include you know, physicists and mathematicians and other kinds of biologists and uh, working with uh, new uh, clinical approaches 
and all seeking uh, support from the National Cancer Institute for uh, their research. This also creates a problem, albeit I would argue a good problem, which is tremendous competition for funding at the NCI. So uh, Vince mentioned uh, the 50% success rates for grant funding uh, back in his era. It was as low as 8% earlier in my career at NCI. We have now, uh, through uh, fairly Herculean measures, gotten it up to 11%, but you can see that is still a very low success rate for grants at the NCI and something we're deeply concerned about because that is the pool of, of grants where uh, the really paradigm changing ideas come from, the things that really move the field for patients. So, you know, in, in, in improving support for investigated initiated science remains a top priority for uh, the NCI. I think many Americans have heard of these, you know, advances and, and really take them for granted. It's like computing power or automobile mileage. We just sort of expect these things to get better indefinitely and not realize all the work that went into that. But uh, that was not the case, as I said, in 1971. That wasn't even the case in the early 1990s. It's really become a, a feature uh, a more recently. And that, as I said, is really built on the molecular understanding of uh, cancer biology that we've developed in the past 50 years. And now I, I think uh, we, we should talk about where we go from here, how we use this progress of the last five decades as a bridge to the, to the future. And this next period of bridge building will build on that momentum that we've established over the last 50 years, but it will not just, uh, but, but and it's not just this momentum of the fundamental understanding of cancer and this knowledge base uh, that with the keen scientific insights of those on whose shoulders we stand now, people like Dr. Calabrese and Dr. DeVita. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about how we're gonna build that bridge to the future building on this progress. Uh, next slide. So what motivated my talk, this title today, is a quote that's been made frequently by uh, the president. Uh, Dr. Uh, president Biden has said uh, many times now that he'd like to end cancer as we know it. And I think uh, Paul Calabrese would be gratified to know that we have this president in the White House with, his, with an intimate connection to cancer research who knows what our work means for the American public. Uh, President Biden and the First Lady have a very strong personal connection uh, to cancer. Uh, we are the, the story of their son's death from glioblastoma is well known to all of us. And they're also firm believers in the power of cancer research. The tragedy that befell the Biden family uh, led to then Vice President Biden's uh, leadership of the cancer moonshot six years ago. And uh, the current administration, as I said, is calling for all of us collectively as a community to end cancer as we know it. We think that this problem is much bigger than just the NCI. The NCI is obviously a part of this, but this would require all the powers of both the federal government, but also advocacy and, and caregivers outside of the federal government. In considering the achievements of the past 50 years and how to steer the future of cancer research, we've been thinking this through at the NCI. What, what does it really mean uh, to end cancer as we know it? So you have to think about how do we know cancer today? What would it mean to change that uh, experience of cancer and, and what would that take? Uh, first, let me, let me uh, be clear, there is no mention of eradicating all cancer. I think based on what we know about human biology today, we don't believe that's possible the NCI at least anytime soon. But we do think we could dramatically change the experience of cancer, that is the tragedy of cancer, the, the way the American public knows cancer today. And to get at this, we, we, we have to be upfront about the uncomfortable realities about cancer uh, as we know it today. So I mentioned a lot of the progress and that progress is very exciting and has been very good, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, in the United States, 600,000 Americans still die from cancer each year. Cancer is still the leading cause of death from children, uh, in children from death from disease. Cancer costs the nation hundreds of billions of dollars every year in terms of treatment and lost productivity. And even when we're able to cure patients with cancer, too often this comes at the cost of severe treatments with significant long-term toxicities. And cancer for many patients is still a very devastating and life-changing diagnosis. And for people with a new diagnosis of cancer, you know, telling them about all this great progress the last few years, that's really small comfort. They don't really wanna hear from the NCI director about the record number of grant applications or FDA approvals or new infrastructure. They really like to see uh, cures or at least better treatments for their cancer, for their, for their disease, which provides them more time. I once treated a woman in her, in her uh, early 40s for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And we tried sort of the usual therapies and it wasn't working, it wasn't going well. And we were discussing what therapy to try next for her. And I, I did what we train our junior oncologists to do. I asked her what her goals were for more therapy. You know, I said, what, what do you wanna get out of this next round of treatment? And as I said, we, this is something we inculcate in our medical students and we sort of beat this habit into the residents and fellows to ask the patient what they want from therapy. It's an important thing to do. But in some ways, it's also kind of a dumb question, right? It's no mystery what our patients want. They generally want 
better treatments for their cancer. They want a cure for their cancer. They want their cancer to go away and never come back. So the goals for therapy are, are usually pretty obvious. What we're really doing in this period is, is trying to get them to understand what's po possible about sort of managing expectations based on what we believe we can deliver. So this patient told me that she knew she would die of cancer. She knew she had untreatable uh, refractory metastatic disease and she had no illusions to uh, being cured, but she wanted more time. She had three children who were sort of middle school age at the time and her goal of hers was to see them graduate from high school. And that's sort of all she wanted was just a few more years. It didn't seem at the time like an unreasonable request given all this progress and work we've had in cancer, but we couldn't even do that for her. She died really about a year later. I've argued many times, many times before that many of us in the cancer community have become afraid about talking about curing cancer. I believe I made this exact point at Yale in 2017, soon after I became NCI director. I know why using the word cure around patients causes so many problems for caregivers. I understand the, uh, the worry about providing false hope and empty promises. Uh, and I know that we have gotten into this habit of qualifying our language all day long of caveats and disclaimers and talking about things like disease-free survival and, and remission and, and whatever metrics sort of in vogue uh, that day. But, uh, but patients, I think we should be clear, still want to be cured of their disease. And if that's not possible, they want their cancer to be turned into a manageable chronic disease. So they'll have more quality time with their loved ones. And so that's really what we're talking about when we say ending cancer as we know it or knowing cancer today. And that's what the president wants us to do. Next slide. So the National Cancer Institute, we've been thinking a lot about what this means to like know cancer in some way. And, and, here, and one way to think about this is things that are true about cancer today. These are true statements uh, that we would like to make untrue in some way. If we could make these things untrue, then in doing so, we would change cancer as we know it. So I've spoken at length already about cancer mortality in this box here in the lower left. Uh, I gave a lecture last April ACR when I described how I believe a strong reduction in cancer mortality is possible, building on momentum we've seen over the last 30 years. I talked about uh, the uh, things that we could do to try and cut uh, cancer uh, age-adjusted mortality in half from its peak in 1990 uh, to uh, you know, half of that in, in the next uh, few years, and some approaches that one could take to try and get there as quickly as possible. And so you, if you think about that, those are things that would really drive down uh, age-adjusted mortality quickly. And you can say this is really the ultimate measure of our progress of cancer is how many people are, are dying of cancer. But you know, there is a lot more to the experience of cancer than just mortality. And today I wanted to focus on some of those other topics that we talked less about. And so a few of those statements are shown here. Uh, so for example, we have too few ways to prevent cancer. Uh, many treatments are so toxic that they are intolerable and cause lifelong morbidity. Too many patients are stymied, stymied by the complicated logistics of cancer care and, 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 and create these disparities because of access to care. And I know we can all think of other statements that are true about cancer, the things that we'd like to make untrue about cancer. I believe it's within our power to deliver on the president's call to action to confront the current reality of cancer and unravel it, to take today's in many ways sad reality and realize a better future. In the months ahead, I want all of us in the cancer community to consider the steps we can take to solve these problems as we've solved many other related problems over the past five decades. I don't really have time today to develop, delve into all of these, so I thought I'd pick a few to talk about, and the ones that I boxed here are the areas where I'd like to focus uh, some examples today. Uh, as mentioned, we've already talked about mortality a bit, so I thought I'd take on uh, uh, early detection and screening, uh, health inequities, and uh, refractory and uh, rare cancers. Uh, next slide. So in 1971, cancer screening and detection was really in its infancy, but we know, now know that screening and early detection are really powerful tools for improving cancer outcomes in both individuals, but also at the population level. It's clear that development of effective uh, screening approaches has been transformative, but we think things are, are really early in this field still and believe screening and detection could be even more impactful than they are today. So now we have effective screening tools for, for cervical cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer. And even though their uptake is not as good as we would like, especially by the way for lung cancer, the screening modalities for these diseases have had a dramatic impact on US cancer mortality already. I spoke with someone recently uh, who had been described, uh, had been diagnosed recently uh, with early stage breast cancer, with screen detected breast cancer, found at mammography. And she described to me what an inconvenience this was, how it had been a little frightening at first, but then it just had become more of a hassle. She'd had sort of a minimal surgery and a, and a brief course of radiotherapy and was told that she would enjoy 
an excellent prognosis. And that's really the kind of experience we want to see for more types of cancer. I mean, can you imagine anyone in 1971 talking about, you know, a diagnosis like that being an inconvenience? You know, now, now that's a, a, a problem that uh, is in some ways a good problem. But even after many advances in detecting and treating cancer, the uncomfortable reality is that we still lack effective ways to detect many types of cancer before they spread and become more difficult to treat. And the cancer types with some of the worst outcomes, frankly, are those where the disease can only be detected typically when it's too late to treat effectively. Think, you know, pancreatic cancer and glioblastoma, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Lung cancer is an area where the National Cancer Institute work should be highlighted. Uh, it's had an important impact on early cancer screening and early detection. I think this group will be aware of the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, which was a landmark study led by the NCI that showed that CT scanning could reduce mortality from lung cancer in specific populations related to age and history of smoking. This result was confirmed by a similar European trial and now low-dose CT screening is really considered the, the standard of care for patients of certain age with certain history of tobacco use uh, as a, an effective means of reducing lung cancer mortality. And this is an example of how we can rigorously test an approach and move it into broad community practice and then refine it further through further study. This is really also an important illustration of some very uh, critical nuances related to cancer screening. So for example, the screening guidelines that were finally established in 2013 by the United States Preventative Services Task Force, the USPSDF, excluded large numbers of patients from screening because of the cutoffs that were chosen. And this particularly applied to women and African-American individuals who had lower smoking uh, histories, not, not as many pack years. And these individuals hadn't, hadn't smoked enough to meet the cutoffs, but they nonetheless faced a higher risk of dying from lung cancer. So the NCI sought to address this issue by performing a modeling in our CISNET network. Uh, and we concluded that screening guidelines should be amended to protect patients with even a more modest history of tobacco use. And based on that work, the latest revision of the USPSDF guidelines for lung cancer lowered those thresholds, a change that is a particular benefit to female and African-American smokers that are now eligible for screening. Uh, a side note, by the way, a similar recent USPSDF change was made to colorectal screen, uh, colonoscopy and colorectal screening uh, guidelines, also based on NCI-sponsored CISNET modeling. So the, the main problem right now with lung cancer today is it's vastly underutilized for reasons that I do not completely understand. We've modeled what a more robust uptake of lung cancer screening could, it could mean in terms of overall cancer mortality in the United States, and it's a real opportunity. Uh, and the NCI is funding many, many studies in this sort of this field of dissemination and implementation science to understand uh, why an effective screening modality is so vastly underutilized. But I think the story of lung cancer screening shows how the NCI can play a really important role in developing the preliminary science, disseminating that greater, and then refining those recommendations, all for public health benefit. Uh, next slide. So a broader adoption of proven methodologies like lung cancer screening will be important, but there are also exciting new technologies for early cancer detection. One particular uh, approach are these so-called multi-cancer early detection tests, or IMSEDs. Uh, the idea here is a single test, usually a blood test, done on otherwise healthy individuals at some regular interval, think yearly, uh, to diagnose several cancers at once by detecting features of the cancer in a single analyte, a tube of blood. And there are really many, many approaches to this. There's DNA methylation, there's cell-free DNA, there's exosomes, et cetera, et cetera. I believe this concept holds a great promise and these technologies are evolving rapidly and entering large uh, scale clinical testing as we speak. And I think these approaches could uh, potentially reduce cancer mortality at the population level, but they have to be rigorously evaluated in a timely manner. As I think this group is aware, cancer screening is a tricky business because there's always this worry about overdiagnosis and overtreatment and the ability to harm patients through cancer screening. And so evaluating these technologies will be challenging. Parenthetically, for those of you who've been following, around, following uh, news in, the, in, in, in DC, will have heard about this new entity called ARPA-H, which at this point is still a proposal of being taken up by Congress to create a new agency akin to DARPA. And DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So ARPA-H would be the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. And this would be within the NCI, but with different structures and authorities to enable the rapid development of high-risk, high-reward projects. And I, I believe, and others have, have, have also stated, that uh, ARPA-H might be a good instrument for evaluating a new technology like this, as there's this very pressing need to evaluate these technologies as soon as possible. Uh, next slide. Uh, let me turn to another major problem that we uh, have uh, failed to adequately address, and that, that is cancer uh, health disparities and inequity in, health, in, in cancer care. And this is a whole constellation of issues that drive uh, disparities in outcome for, outcomes for our patients. 
We face important disparities in cancer diagnosis and treatment, trial access, and an outcome based on race, region, access to care, socioeconomic status, and other things. In other words, different demographic groups are affected differently by the health challenges they face and the circumstances in which they face them. Think about the challenges that many people with cancer face and how their specific circumstances impact their care and their experience. So Sherry Davis is a patient of the NCI knows who needed cancer treatment in Florida, but couldn't find a doctor who take Medicaid that was closer than three counties away. And another patient, Barbara Inglesby, drove 100 miles every weekday for radiation treatment. And uh, several states away, we had Albert Calloway, who had a neck tumor that grew and grew uh, because this individual was uninsured and was overwhelmed by the process of trying to figure out uh, how he fit within the healthcare system. Uh, these are three real patients, and it's clear that experiences like this in the United States are entirely too common. While we've made great progress for overall in cancer research and care, these benefits have not uh, reached all people equally. So the NCI has long sought to address cancer health disparities, and we were working in this area even before that term, healthcare disparities, really was available in research. But of course, recent events, and I'm talking about the death of George Floyd and the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on the poor and disenfranchised, these recent events have injected, and rightfully so, I believe, a new focus and passion and commitment to addressing disparities in the entire NIH, including the NCI. That said, these problems are very hard. If their answers were easy, we'd have solved them by now. Uh, next slide. Cervical cancer is an interesting example of the com complexity of cancer health disparities. So here is a graph showing the incidence of this disease over time, and it shows a very positive trend. There's been this remarkable decline in cervical cancer incidence in the United States over the last few decades. And we have uh, completely eliminated the difference in incidence between African-American and white women. And this is good news, and it reflects increased screening for cervical cancer, as well as an effective uh, HPV vaccination. And while we should celebrate this progress with regard to this important health to care disparity, we should also note that at the same time that a very large difference in mortality from cervical cancer still exists today. So even today, Black women in the U.S. are more than 50% likely to die of this disease than white women. So first, I think as a scientist, you just have to admit this is interesting. How can we have so much progress against incidence and not mortality? And why is this cancer so much more lethal in Black women than white women? And one can invoke a lot of explanations for this. This could be differences in biology or differences in risk factors or differences in access to care, structural racism in the healthcare system. All of these explanations have plausibility. And in cancer health disparities, let me tell you, it's generally not one of these. It's going to be a combination of multiple things creating these disparities. But it's really the business of the National Cancer Institute to figure this out. We should support the research that would identify the causes of these disparities and, and that's really the key to address to fixing these problems. Uh, next slide. Race and ethnicity are two features of society that drive healthcare cancer health disparities, but there are many other important contributors. Increasingly, we're appreciating that cancer outcomes are driven by geography, which we think is related to access. For example, we know that people who live in rural communities have worse cancer outcomes, regardless of race or ethnicity. Cancer incidence and mortality overall are higher in rural areas than in urban ones. This has not always been true in the United States. In the early 1990s, uh, rural patients did better than urban patients, but that, that trend is reversed and, and the disparity between ur and urban and rural patients uh, gets worse every year. This observation holds true for cancer overall, but particularly for cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, kidney cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, and oropharyngeal cancers. Along these lines, a recent study from NCI grantees published this month revealed that women residing in urban areas were significantly more likely to get the recommended colorectal cancer screening compared with women in rural states, or areas of 11 states. However, both groups had similar rates of adherence to breast cancer screening, sort of showing how complex this is. So you, you sort of get a different effect of rurality on colorectal cancer screening versus uh, breast cancer screening, that is colonoscopy versus mammography. But perhaps I think the most important thing to uh, realize about health disparities research is really the need to, to stop solely focusing on a single feature of these complex heterogeneous populations. So shown here is, is, is a beginning to try and get our handle on this. This is uh, the, the topic of persistent poverty, which is defined as 20% of the population living below the poverty threshold for decades. And we note that the outcomes of patients living in areas of persistent poverty are worse than patients who are living in areas that are merely currently poor. That is, they're socioeconomically the same today, but one has had structural poverty going back decades, and that population does worse. So no, uh, so socioeconomic status alone can't really capture what's going on here, and we need more sophisticated approaches to understand this interaction between rurality and poverty, particularly through time. 
We have other examples, uh, for example, the, 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 the example of American Indians where overall cancer outcomes are not that bad, but in, in, in certain, the interaction with poverty in that population is particularly uh, adverse. And we see these terrible pockets of very poor outcomes in the American Indian population, for example. So we have lots of data now showing these sort of nonlinear inter interactions between like things like race and ethnicity and genetics and poverty and rurality. And these interactions can produce some really counterintuitive effects. And so really we think of the NCI, a key for cancer disparities is to stop sort of the single variable analyses and start working it on these populations in their totality with all their complexity. Uh, next slide. As mentioned, uh, the, the NCI has been interested in the topic of health disparities and minority health uh, for some time. Uh, this shows a trend in our funding uh, in the, uh, for these topics dating back to 2010. Uh, the NCI has uh, had a significant spin in this area for, for over for decades, but you can see that has uh, sharply increased in the last few years. Although this is a large investment in this area of science, we believe it is very important to continuously monitor this portfolio. And we think it's fair to ask if we're spending on the right topics, and we're asking the right questions on the field uh, for the field, and should we be even spending more in these areas? We also know that cancer research workforce uh, the, the, the scientists and doctors uh, that do the cancer science, that workforce does not reflect the population of the people we serve. And we've really redoubled our efforts to make headway against the problem of underrepresentation within the cancer research workforce. We all share a responsibility to change uh, this in whatever way we can and to bake health equity into sort of everything we do. And how we, uh, that's how we, how we believe an important key to ending cancer as you know it, the president's goal. Uh, next slide. Uh, given the lack of diversity in the cancer research workforce, I am excited about several efforts from the NCI to address this problem. So uh, one that is reasonably well known is the NCI's CURE program. This is the continuing umbrella of research experiences. This program is a pipeline program, if you will, that starts sort of in middle school or high school and uh, it provides support for individuals all the way to uh, the junior faculty level. It has thousands of alumni, some of the most famous uh, uh, researchers in cancer going today are alumni of the, of the CURE program and really trains them for success. And it is the idea that a pipeline is a way to address uh, the lack of representation in science. Uh, another effort that is different, that is really exciting is shown here, and this is the FIRST initiative. So FIRST stands for the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation. This is a common fund initiative, uh, meaning it's led, it, it, the money to support this comes from the NIH, but it's led by the NCI working in collaboration with the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, NIMHD. The purpose of the FIRST cohort is to transform the culture at NIH-funded extramural institutions by building a self-reinforcing community of scientists committed to diversity and inclusive excellence. The rationale here is that a cohort model of faculty hiring, sponsorship, and mentoring will lead to really sustained support for professional development embedded within an institution that's committed to workforce diversity. Uh, here's the sort of first set of awardees. There are two more rounds of this coming. In fact, the next round of grants is due uh, soon. Uh, you see it has a coordinating center at Morehouse and then six awardees, and it's an experiment in this cohort approach, which will include significant data collection to see if the scientists, uh, the, the, the faculty trained through FIRST will benefit from this program. And so you, so we, you see the NCI is invested in the cohort approach with FIRST and with the pipeline approach through CURE, and we, we are really trying to consider whatever uh, approach might uh, work best in terms of developing faculty diversity. Next slide. Let me also talk a little bit about rare and difficult to treat cancers. Just as our advances in cancer research have not benefited all populations, our progress has not been even across all cancer types. You see here Senator McCain, who died of glioblastoma, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died of pancreatic cancer, Chadwick Boseman, who died uh, of early onset colorectal cancer. Uh, we uh, are seeing an alarming rise in the rate of colorectal cancer in, lung pa in young patients for reasons that are not clear. The five-year survival rate for glioblastoma, the, which affected Senator McCain, is less than 7%. Uh, pancreatic cancer, it's less than 11%. So, but among these stories, you also see uh, in the upper left corner here, a little girl named Rihanna, who had infantile fibrosarcoma, which was a, a, a heretofore terrible disease. Uh, but she was treated with larotrectinib, a TREC inhibitor that allowed her to avoid am amputation. So hers is a success story in a rare cancer uh, that speaks to the long arc of basic science discovery to successful clinical advance. Uh, the story of TREC inhibitors, for those of you who know it, begins really at the NCI at Frederick National Lab back in the 1980s when Mariana Barba said working as a contractor was hunting for oncogenes, and he found one called Onco-D, which was later turned out, shown to be the first fusion known in cancer and uh, involving the TREC gene, 
uh, in 2018, larotrectinib, uh, which was used in Rihanna's cancer, was the first drug approved to treat uh, intract gene fusions, and it is quite a successful drug for those rare patients that have those events. Uh, next slide. Another nice example is the DART trial. This is the NCI dual anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1 blockade in rare tumors trial. It's the first immunotherapy trial focused on rare cancers. Uh, here, uh, you know, the DART trial has, has been tried in many uh, different rare cancers. Here are the results in angiosarcoma where you can see a patient with a quite bad tumor involving the face and nose with this very nice response to combined immuno-oncology approaches. Uh, these results are impressive and encouraging. Uh, you can see in about a quarter of the patients, there are these very uh, impressive responses with some patients having their cancers go away entirely. Uh, this is a, a remarkable for a number of ways, uh, for me, uh, reasons. Uh, we, uh, a subtype of uh, angiosarcoma had been identified earlier through the Count Me In initiative that included a, 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 you know, about 25% of patients that had high tumor mutational burden and would therefore be a, a candidate for immuno-oncology. And then this trial happens almost within a year. Uh, to confirm activity in some patients. A DART is uh, an important platform. It is not, as I said, solely restricted to angiosarcoma. It's looking at other rare subtypes of cancer, 53 cohorts in all, including cancers of the ovary and intestines and lung and sinuses, just rare cancers wherever they may be found. Uh, and we think that this is uh, the kind of approach that really has to uh, be taken for these kinds of rare cancers that are not amenable to traditional clinical trials. Uh, next slide. The MATCH trial uh, employs this basket approach. Uh, when MATCH started, the idea was to sequence patients with refractory cancer and then allocate them to therapy in one of up to 40 treatment arms based on the molecular genetics of a tumor. Uh, and when we started, we thought this might uh, appeal to some patients with rare and uncommon cancers. But in fact, uh, the trial really exceeded our initial expectations with about 60% of those enrolled on MATCH having cancers other than colon, rectal, breast, non-small cell, lung, or prostate. So it really uh, it preferentially enrolled patients from these sort of less common cancer uh, types and it turned out to be a great uh, rare cancer uh, 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 framework. MATCH, uh, for example, has shown uh, promising results in treating HER2 amplified salivary gland tumors, a, a rare cancer subtype, uh, and treating these patients with TDM1, uh, producing significant sh shrinkage, uh, significant responses, a significant fraction of the patients. MATCH is also remarkable. It was one of the fastest enrolling clinical trials ever done at the NCI. Enroll patients at 1,100 sites and 6,000 patients in just a few years. And uh, so I think things like MATCH and DART really established this basket trial approach as being quite successful. Uh, next slide. Childhood cancer is, is collectively rare, com comprising approximately 1% to 3% of cancers diagnosed in the United States. But uh, this rarity is, uh, as I said, of no comfort to anyone who's watched a child suffer from cancer to treat and its treatment. And it makes our quest to end childhood cancer uh, challenging. There just isn't enough data in any sort of one tumor type to really do uh, some of the traditional clinical trials we think of. And so one effort to try and address this problem is the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative. This is a 10-year effort that's, that's really just begun. It's in its second year. And the idea here is to try and sort of radically aggregate data uh, from children with cancer to make them maximally informative for research and for improved clinical care. Two important parts of the CCDI are shown here. The Childhood Molecular Characterization Protocol which would sort of establish a floor of molecular analysis available to every child with cancer in the United States, and then a national childhood cancer registry shown on the right, which would try and learn from every child that would get some data uh, through integration of registry data and various other sorts of data sets that we have to try and get an idea of what happens with the experience of cancer is for all children with cancer in the United States. And we think these are really important uh, efforts to try and uh, do better in childhood cancer, a collection of rare diseases. Uh, next slide. Uh, so having discussed some of the challenges we face, cancer as we know it today, the reality is that we will still need more progress with regard to early detection, disparities, and advances in, in rare and difficult to treat cancers. Uh, there are some questions shown in the slide that are equally important that I haven't touched on, that, that I haven't touched on today, but really I, I think they, they sort of spur us to think about what the future will look like. What are we working toward? If we're building a bridge to the future of cancer, what's on the other side of that bridge? a world where these statements are no longer true, where we will have changed cancer as we know it. And I, I think that future is within our reach. Let's focus on a future where all people with cancer have the support and resources needed to navigate their care. Let's build a reality in which your location or your race or your education doesn't predict the outcome of your disease. And let's take what we've learned uh, and, 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 and create tests that identify cancer at its earliest stages. And let's ensure that once these cancers are detected, 
each cancer can be treated, treated effectively. Uh, and how we're gonna do that, uh, next slide. This is what the NCI thinks will take, what it will take you know, over this next period. You know, we've had this 50 years of progress. Now we need to build on that 50 years of progress to advance health equity, to personalize cancer care, to embrace new technologies and innovations, to inspire the next generation of cancer researchers and to prepare for the challenges of the future. And this is a set of, of, of guideposts, so the foundations on which we'll build this bridge to the future. I would argue that we need to look at all our work through a lens of health equity. We need to ask to what extent might this study reinforce existing inequities or might reflect hidden biases. And you can clearly see how these guideposts are interwoven and overlapping and building the next generation of diverse researchers as part of embracing innovation and creativity. Uh, next slide. Today in our age of, of rapid progress and technical and medical advances, it may be easy to discount the importance of the National Cancer Act, but as 1776 was our nation's history and 1969 was the Apollo program that put a uh, human on the moon, so 1971 really, I begin, marks the modern era of cancer research. Maybe this comparison strikes you as a little bit over the top, but I do not believe that is so. Ending cancer, as we know, it will be a bigger deal for humanity, or as big a deal for humanity as landing someone on the moon. And 1971 is really what got it started. And that's why that anniversary, this anniversary is so important. It was signed into a law at a time of great need for those people who feared cancer so much, which at the time was basically everyone. The NCA's first 50 years was the work of people like Mary Lasker and optimistic politicians and pioneering oncologists and researchers were visionary, as I said, but also naive, as I said. The optimism induced by the legal mandate and strong infrastructure was soon tempered by the realization that its objective was gonna be so challenging. The years ahead will be sharper in focus, different in tone and more practical, more cognizant of the size and timelines of these challenges and more based on the foundational molecular biology, uh, biological understanding of cancer. Over the past five decades, many of this is declared this time is different, but they weren't wrong. And that's what's brought us so far to date. Each time we try this is different. It was reportedly Heraclitus who observed that no one ever steps in the same river twice. The river changes. In cancer research, we have passed thresholds as compared with 1971. We now have a molecular understanding of these diseases and we're ready to take a crack at this again. I, I've been trying to make this point for a while now and I found an actually a really good analogy that I like a lot in an excellent book on the history of the National Cancer Act by Abbe Gluck and, and Charlie Fuchs, both of, of, of Yale, entitled A New Deal for Cancer. And it makes a point that I've long believed. It points out that the optimism for so many of the players uh, held for the rapid cure in 1971. For example, Sidney Farber said he thought a cure could, for cancer could be achieved by 1976. But as the book notes, the foundational understanding of cancer hadn't really been grasped in 1971. And so there's this quote from Sol Spiegelman, who was director of Columbia's Institute for Cancer Research that I really like, which says an all out effort at this time would be like trying to land a moon a man on the moon without knowing Newton's laws of gravity. 50 years now later, we know what we don't know and that's what's changed. And we know how we're gonna end cancer as we know it when before we really didn't know that. Next slide. So whatever our progress or whatever our successes, it is certain that they will be possible only because of the work of the last 50 years. And it really build on the work of individuals like Paul Calabrese and the legislation that enabled so much of, of, of his work. I suspect that those of who worked so hard to get President Nixon's signature uh, in 1971, might have been disappointed to know that a half century later, we're still losing 600,000 Americans each year to cancer. But I hope they would have been, they would be gratified to learn that despite the fact that the problems turned out to be so much more complex than we ever imagined, the passion, inspiration, dedication of the generations that followed have led to astounding progress nonetheless. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today and thank you for the opportunity to be back at you. Uh, thanks, Ned. That was wonderful. And I, I think uh, Paul is probably watching from a high and you know, very happy to see all the progress. It's our tradition at the Calabrese Lecture to ask his brother Guido uh, to ask the first question. And I see uh, Guido's on in Italy. Guido, can you hear me? Unmute, start vintage. Here I am. I'm in Italy. And I was delighted. Can you see me? And can you hear me? You can. This is yes. wonderful. Yeah, Sarah. Hello. I was delighted with the lecture because 50 years ago, Paul said to me that the aim was realistically not to end cancer, but to get so that a cancer diagnosis was no different from a diagnosis of high blood pressure or of cardiac problems so that somebody might live 
for the longest of time or shortest of time, but that cancer was not a death sentence, but was a life sentence to be dealt with decently and well. And this lecture was so much in that line that it made me smile because that's what Paul was about. But there's something else in this lecture which really struck me, and that was the continuing difference, even when there are diagnoses of it at the same time in results among people because of race, because of poverty, because of all the things that have cursed us in America over so long. And I just wonder how much the fact that monies are being given to cancer as they should, because cancer is such a dramatic disease in people's mind, how much this can be used not only to diminish these differences in cancer treatment, but in treatment of diseases generally. That is using what is needed to make cancer treatment more equal to different people based on race and poverty so that all medical treatment becomes more equal in this country. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Judge Calabrese. The, uh, and it's a very important question. And, and, and I think a, a really important point to make is that, you know, addressing the things that drive disparities in health outcomes in the United States will not just benefit patients with cancer. They would benefit, you know, presumably, uh, and we actually have very strong evidence that they would benefit, uh, you know, individuals for lots of diseases uh, and, and would improve uh, health in, in many ways for the public. So think about something like uh, tobacco control, which has really yes. been quite successful in certain populations in the United States and not so successful in other populations and tends to correlate with, you know, continued combustible use of combustible tobacco uh, correlates with low socioeconomic status and, and less education. And, you know, if we could reach those pockets, uh, the benefits of tobacco control would be way beyond cancer. They would, they would go to many other diseases and general health. So it's, it's a really important question. And we, we think that the, uh, in, in, through the last, uh, you know, I'd say 20 years, the NCI has become very interested in this topic of dissemination and implementation science. It's like when you know something works, it works just fine at the tertiary ca cancer, uh, excellent, outstanding academic hospital, but then it doesn't translate down to the community. What happened there? Why, why doesn't that work? And where, where's the, where do things break down? Uh, obviously, um, many of these things uh, are, are ascribable to things that we, we know a lot about, you know, the fractured nature of U.S. healthcare, uh, you know, inequities in education, for example, in the United States. But I'm, also, I'm struck by how often uh, disparities are often driven by things that we didn't appreciate as being so important. You know, for example, a, a study in, in, in disparities in ER positive uh, breast cancer by race showed that a large part of the disparity was driven by adherence to therapy of the medicine. So it was really the ability, the ability to continue to take medicine because of costs of the medicine or presumably the hassle of going to the pharmacy. So, you know, I think we had lots of reasons in our mind why that disparity existed, but, you know, one of the main drivers was really something so narrow and addressable. So that, that's why I think this, this line of research is, is really important. Obviously, the NCI, with its mirror on the order of $7 billion a year budget, can't fix care and education in the United States. Those are much bigger problems, but I think we can do the foundational science that explains what's really driving these inequities. Thanks, Ned. Uh, Stephen Calabresi has a question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharples, for that presentation. It was really wonderful. Uh, there may be an easy answer to this question, but uh, I was curious, given the recent advances in immunotherapy in treating cancer, and given the remarkable su success of the mRNA vaccines that Moderna and Pfizer developed against COVID, is there more work to be done on vaccination to prevent cancer? Uh, and is that a field that is potentially uh, worth looking into in the future? Uh, yes, no, I think that, um, you know, the mRNA platform is very exciting and uh, particularly for the potential of sort of what are called bespoke, you know, totally personalized medicines. And uh, certainly an area we've been thinking a lot about. Uh, Moderna, I think you're, you're probably aware, started out as a cancer company. I mean, some of their initial products were we're targeting cancer and, and, and I think pivoted for a variety of reasons related to technology to vaccines, uh, but still has an interest in cancer and is still supporting uh, clinical trials in cancer patients. Uh, and, and so I think that this approach 
uh, makes a lot of sense in the area of, of personalized vaccines, but maybe maybe other areas as well. I can tell you that I, I have one concern about it that uh, we don't talk about very much, but I think we should probably talk about more, which is that you know having spent time at FDA, the regulatory pathway for bespoke medicines is entirely unclear to me. It is not certain how you would take a medicine that you intend to use in one individual and make that into an FDA approved product under current law. And I think that, um, and, and frankly, I know this is a big turnoff to many of the industry partners in this space who are worried about how they would make a viable product. Even if you could use it in thousands of cancer patients, if the product is different in each patient, it's a different molecule in each patient, you know, how is that gonna work from a regulatory framework? So I think we need some clarity on this topic. I think the, uh, you know, the FDA uh, needs to provide further guidance on bespoke products. And, and perhaps we even need legislators to write new law in this area. But it's really exciting, it, and it goes beyond ca cancer, by the way. There are many, many rare diseases, particularly rare diseases of children, where these highly personalized medicines could be valuable as well. So I think as a society, it's really pressing we figure this out. Great. Great. Well, well, listen, we're at the hour, but we have one special guest. And before I do that, I just want to remind the fellows that we have a half an hour virtual lunch with Dr. Sharpless, so please stay on this very line. But I'm really excited. Eric Weiner, are you on? So Eric is our new director, and actually, he gave the Calabrese lecture about eight, nine years ago. And Eric, I'd just love for you to say a few words uh, if you have time. I think we, we missed our window. Well, uh, um, that's okay. So Eric was a Calabrese lecturer. Uh, we're very happy that he was here today. Um, and he heard, the, he heard your talk, Ned, and I'm sure you have business with him in the not too distant future. Yeah, no, I know. I, I, you know, I, I've known Eric a while, given the Boston connection, and I think uh, what what a what a great development and turn of events to see him assume a leadership role at Yale and at the NCI. We look very forward to working with Eric. Great. Well, listen, this has been absolutely fantastic. We had one of our largest uh, turnouts for grand rounds uh, in the virtual era, and and what we're going to do now is I'm going to thank you, Ned, and uh, thank you, Vince. Uh, Ned and Vince are going to stay on with me with the fellows.